All right, this week I have a very special guest. I know I've said that before, but this week actually is a super special guest to my heart. Scott Valens is the founder and CEO of Go Rascal. Go Rascal is changing, is changing, change the world in the mortgage game. When it comes to mortgage brokerages, everything has really been done um, by a certain protocol for decades. And Go Rascal took a forward thinking approach and changed their business model, changed their, changed the business model of how the industry is actually run. And it has led them to now be the fastest growing mortgage brokerage in the entire country, probably the entire world. And it's all led by this guy, Scott Valens. What's up? Thanks for coming. Yeah. Is that a good description of Go Rascal? Like 100% accurate, no exaggeration. Right, and that was like pretty much to the T. <laughs> yeah. So, Go Rascal. Yeah. What are you guys doing right now? Right now we are growing in a pretty crappy market, right? Uh, 2023, uh, 2023 was a massive recession for the residential real estate yeah, space. Yeah, the least amount of homes sold in one calendar year in I think 30 years. Yeah, I think mortgages just follows that as well. I think it's our worst year in 30 years, pretty much production wise. Um, and we're bucking the trend uh, by adding a lot of loan officers to our team. We added 105 LOs in the beginning of 2022, we had five. So oh, the last wow. 18 months we added over 100. Um, we're just hopefully doubling. 105 you, you added. And are these uh, LOs loan officers. Right, LOs loan officers. So are these loan officers, are they uh, independent contractors or are they employees? Uh, kind of a hybrid. For the most part, they're outside salespeople, independent. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of you know, requirements other than production, right? We want to bring on loan officers who are in the game. Frankly, a lot last year got out. Uh, so are you recruiting? Like, yep. how does that work? Yeah, so we have a full recruiting team. We do all the, you know, social media, drip campaigns, cold outreach. We have a weekly webinar that I host every Thursday. It's an anonymous hour where we go through a whole presentation on why go rascal. So it's our, it's, it's our number one growth mechanism. Um, and we even just recently changed our, our um, mission statement to um, the happiest home for loan officers, right? So we're not ultimately the cost of the buyer. I saw that. You saw that? I saw What'd that. What'd you think? I thought it was great. Yeah. You know, I, I hit you up the other day. I was like, dude, the content you're putting out and that goes hand in hand with the content. It's the, the branding and yeah. the, the, the constant pushing of the positive messages. Yep. Uh, yeah, used, we used to be, our, our old uh, mission statement was a different breed of mortgage, kind of playing into like the Go Rascal. We use a dog as our, yeah. as our, our thing. Um, and I do think we're a different breed still, but uh, we had to, we retooled this thing and we said, all right, like if the loan officer is our customer, the loan officer's customer is the borrower and the buyer and the real estate agent and whatnot. But for Go Rascal, you know, our kind of executive team or whatever, we're focused on recruiting and adding really good talent through loan officers and they're our customers. We have to wake up every day thinking about like how do we build and continue to build a very happy home for them. So they come over, they come quickly, they stay, and they help us recruit other loan officers too. And the big thing with them coming in is a big thing that makes everybody happy. You're, they're able to make more money when they yep. come to Go Rascal, right? Yep. That's, the, that's the ultimate why. Not like, yes, it's happier, so it's great work environment, but also the monetary gain from moving from wherever they were to go rascal. Yeah, our, uh, our, our main value prop is something we call the balance blueprint. And it starts with like really high commission splits. So there's really not a loan officer that's gonna come here that we're gonna interview who's gonna be earning more per loan um, at their previous place than here, right? So like right out of the gate, it's a very tangible uh, value prop, very tangible benefit. But then we balance it, we say, okay, you're gonna make a lot of money. We're also gonna support you really well. Because the misnomer uh, around the mortgage broker channel compared to working for a bank is, I'm not going to get the support I need. You're going to bring me on. Absolutely. And I'm going to be off on my own having to figure everything out. And it's going to crash and burn. And maybe I'll close a loan, but my client won't have a good experience. And the real estate agent won't be happy. And I'll make more money, but I won't get five more referrals. And so early on, we knew we would have that, that pushback from, from loan officers at other companies. Like, yeah, I see. Like, pay me more, but... 
it's the setup's too good here. And so we kind of reverse engineered it and said, no, 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 no. Like, why is your setup good? We're going to make it as good, if not better here. And that's what we've done. And are you able to make it better? Because uh, you think a lot of times when you're giving more back to the, the employee or, you know, I guess not the customer, so yeah, the employee, you're giving back to the loan officer, um, it's, they're going to lose somewhere. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, th I think in the real estate business, I was at level group where I had the highest split you could possibly imagine, mm -hmm. but I did everything on my own. In mm -hmm. 11 and a half years, I'm literally all my marketing, all my, you name it, I did it on my own. I paid for it on my own. There was a little bit of support, but then I go from there to a company, like I went to Compass and now Sirhan, where the support is so much more massive, but you pay for it. Right. There's a heavier split. Yep. I'm giving so much more of my closings to the company versus that level group where I had no support. How are you able to support people without getting that much more money coming in from them? Yeah, it's a great question. And I will say that the support um, doesn't suit every loan officer because we leverage technology a lot, right? If I have a loan officer who's like, I love the support where I'm at and everything's done on a manual basis. I pick up the phone and call and get a one-on-one -on -one answer and support from someone every time I need them. I don't want to log into a portal or watch a video or go to a chat group on Slack or whatever and type something up and wait for an answer there. Yeah, they're going to probably say this might not be the right, the right fit for me, but like that's okay. There's a lot of efficiency, a lot of loan, great loan officers out there, but most of them who are set up to excel now and into the future know they have to leverage technology and kind of be at the forefront to even have a future in this business. And so, yeah, we leverage technology. And remember, we're mortgage brokers. So we work directly with lenders. We don't really lend our own money. We broker it out. And so in our particular space in the broker channel, we have lenders like United Wholesale Mortgage, who are biggest lender in the country, the most advanced technology in the country, the most well-funded and well-positioned from support tech and everything. And so we partner with them. And so even though I don't have 15 back office staff members that can answer an underwriting question, they do. That's and amazing. so that's how we made it work. I, that's, I don't spend money. They, we send them a lot of loans and they do everything under the sun for us. And so. they're probably super happy to have you as their preferred lender. Totally, it's a partnership. Um, and do you, is there any sort of community within the loan officers where it's loan officers supporting loan officers? Because I think about like in my office, you know, agents, whether you're on team A, B, C, or D, mm -hmm. everyone's in the office supporting everybody. Yep. So we are a bit of a, a virtual company, right? We're headquartered here in Brooklyn, New York, but we source loan officers from all over the country. Most of them are in the tri-state area, but since COVID, they don't want to come in the office. Right. They want to be out in the field, meeting with agents, meeting with borrowers and then shooting content, doing whatever. They don't want to come into the office to be on, a, on a, uh, their computer or whatever. Um, so we leverage Slack as our tool. We have these Slack Amazing. rooms where, and we've actually tagged loan officers who have come to the company who are huge givers and said, hey, do you want to be a team lead? Hmm. Like, it looks like it comes natural to you to help people. Like, let's create an actual role for you in addition to doing mortgages and you'll be able to give back and they don't really want anything in return. They're like, really? I'm just so, so happy. It's not like they're eating off of, if they're a team no. lead, they're not eating off people's plate. So good question. So no, so the actual team leads is a completely different designation to just say you're a loan officer team lead, meaning like people might email you or reach out to you for one-on-one -on -one support. They don't get anything. What we do offer though, is every loan officer who joins our company and recruits other loan officers and puts in effort to bring them over and help nurture them and support them when we're here, we pay a recruiting fee to them um, out of our company commission, not out of that loan officer's commission. Once the person they've brought in has closed X amount of business. Yeah, they, uh, loan by loan, they get a piece of, the, they get a piece of our margin, oh, not wow. that loan officer's. Who else is doing what you do in the business? There's other companies that are. We're pretty much the only game in town in New York and really the Northeast. Um, We've modeled it off, off of other successful mortgage companies that have done this at scale, but really we're creating our own version of it. That support piece that I talk about is typically not, av not available at, at the level I'm describing at some of these other shops that are doing it. Um, and we're just trying to do a better job of, of being able to offer that support without you know, undercutting you know, commissions and whatnot. And when you looked at 
the model for Go Rascal? Were you only looking at kind of what works in different mortgage companies or was there other businesses, other companies in a different industry that you're like, that's great, let's see how we could make that functional within mortgages? So we didn't do that just because I think these other mortgage companies, probably, you know, the, the trailblazers of this model mm -hmm. did it for us. But when you, we describe it to most people, they say, oh, that's just like a real estate, like you're yeah. already bringing it up. Discount real estate brokerage, like we're not gonna do much, but we're gonna give you the majority of the, of the pie. Um, that seems to be what everyone else mentions. I don't know if this exists in other industries. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we just saw other people doing it and said, let's jump on board, but let's, let's make, let's create our own culture, our own style, and let's be a little bit different. Um, kind of a blue ocean strategy a little bit. Yeah, I love that. So yeah. that's where we are now. That's where we are. Where did it all begin? Where, where did it all begin? 20 years ago, where were you? Like what led you into, 20. I guess we call this like, it's kind of the real estate finance world. Mm -hmm. Did you always want to be in that? No, we, so I'll like, tell you a couple. How did, how did you get here? So I was, uh, I went to Cornell University, graduated in 2001, I was living, in, came to New York. I grew up in Florida, so yep. I was like a, Florida boy up in the Ithaca winters for four years. You know, everyone comes to New York City after if you're in college around here. Did a couple of years. Glad so wait, so you're, I know you're a Bucks fan. Mm -hmm. They won the Super Bowl, what, 2001? 2002. 2002. And then, what, 2020? Yeah. 2020, 2021. Uh, yeah, I was at the one in 2021. Amazing. At home. I remember. I, Bucks game I in Tampa, definitely, Super Bowl, first definitely time Definitely texted happened. you that night after. For sure. Oh, 100%. Yeah, that was fun. I was, yeah, I missed the one in 2022 mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, when this happens again, I'm going, I have to be in Tampa. I think I slept in my, my own bed, my yeah. childhood bed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the, the crazy thing about the mortgage business is everyone fell into this, this role. This isn't like a recruited after college or studied for it. So <laughs> when you listen to mortgage podcasts, one of the first questions asks, how'd you get into the business? And everyone's like, happenstance. Um, I moved to LA after a couple years in the city. I was maybe a little bit done with the cold weather after six years, wanted a change, didn't want to go home to Florida for whatever reason. Um, was kind of just job to job in the entertainment business out there on like on production, like physical well, What did work. you go to school for in Cornell? Studied psychology. I was on a pre-med path actually for a while. Huh. So. so what did you do in high school that put you on the pre-med path? Was that based on like what you wanted, what your parents wanted? <laughs> A little of both felt right to me. I was super, I was a very studious uh, uh, student in high school. I was number one in my class. So I was one of those kind of like follow the rules. Were you a valedictorian? I was, yeah. Do you, I was I, it was a while ago. Do you have the speech on VHS? I do. I do. I have it on, I have it on audio and on VHS. If you ask me to produce it tomorrow, yeah. I don't know if I could. I you think need it's in my to parents' that. house. I know, I do. Oh my, that needs to be converted to digital. Yeah, I know, I know. And cut up. And, oh and my yeah. God, that is the content we're talking about. You're right, you're right, you're right, fair. Um, not, not for nothing, what now? No, we're past the 25 year mark, but like we're now like over 25 right, years late. You're right. We're now over 25 years later. You need that, you need you're that, right. you're not right. the audio, but we need the video. I know, you're right, I'll get on that. Uh, so high school, right, studious, Kind of felt right. Like I love, I love, I love the science. Whatever you know, college, pre med felt right. Yeah, but really, I remember studying abroad. I studied abroad in Paris for like seven months. With, lived with a French family, like speaking great French. And I had to come home after call, after that trip, second semester, junior year. I think you go abroad. Yep. And I had to like finish like organic chemistry, which is like the hardest of the classes. So it's like. It, I'm going to med school if I'm doing this because I'm gonna like burn my last like three semesters of college like being in the library, or I'm not because I want to have fun and I don't even know if I really want to do this. So I finished my degree, you know, in sight, but I was, I think that was it. No more med school. <laughs> I respect that. Yeah. So you graduate with a degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. You come back to New York City mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. You're what are you doing here for six years? So I was here two. Two was here years. Two, and then moved to LA. Got I was it. working in management consulting. I got one of those jobs in college, working for Accenture. Um, but it was all screwed up because I moved here, I moved to New York three months before 9-11. Graduated in May of 01. Um, actually, no. Uh, 
Yeah, no, no I, I moved here in May of 2000, graduated, uh, actually, I don't know why the, the, the math isn't adding up, but 9-11 definitely happened uh, Back in my a year day. year late. No, no, it's, yeah, <laughs> anyway. Uh, somehow I was here for 9-11. Yeah. My start date for my job in management consulting got delayed for- Well, what year did you graduate college? You gotta know that. 2001, yes? 2001. May of the 01. Final answer? Yes. Okay. So you graduated college May 2001. You're living here for five months. Five months, five months. And 9 11. Right, happens. but my start date for my job yeah. was deferred a year before I graduated Got it. college that's what, because of that's the dot com recession. So this consulting firm was like, we don't need all these jobs for these kids coming out of college. Mm. So you can either take 10,000 bucks and like get out of here, or you can take 10,000 bucks and wait a year and we'll start you in a year. So what happened was I was living here, 9 11 happened, and I still didn't even have the job I had graduated college for. So 9-11, tired of the cold, not the right job. The job eventually started a year later and I, um, and I bounced, I quit. And I was like, I'm out of here, I wanna go to Cali. Yeah. Bum around a bit. So then 2004, two years in Cali or so, my cousin who I moved out there to live with and stuff, she knew some guys working in the mortgage business. You know, and it was the wild, wild west back then. The yeah. Subprime days. And what was it like? You know, now you have experience, obviously, California, New York, and um, I know you have loan officers all over the country. Mm -hmm. But what was it like getting into the business in California in the early mm -hmm. 2000s? It was amazing and awful at the same time. It was amazing because loans business was flowing so easily, but they were, as we all learn later on, they were loans that were failing and didn't perform well. Right. So what does that? But what does that? Does that mean anything for you as a loan officer? Well, so we're writing these loans to whatever guidelines we are told we can write them to, but the income is being stated, for example, right, and things like that, and it's kind of like Wall Street's buying the paper or whatever. And don't get me wrong, there are grades of how shady a loan can be, mm -hmm. um, but that was the mortgage business back then, and it almost blew up the whole world, so. I mean, 2008 wasn't that far behind. Right, I got in in 04, I worked for a company that I'm not fond of for a year, then I got my own license. So I immediately went off and became my own broker. Oh, wow. Really quickly. One year in the business, I was like, I don't wanna be here, I don't like what's going on here. Left, got my own license, and then kind of from there on out. The know. place where you were working, mm -hmm. can you say their name or you don't? Called United for? Vision Financial. Or was it somewhat of a boiler room type place? Completely. Yeah. Yep. And I guess for you, nice previous pre-med, valedictorian, Cornell, like working in a boiler room setting must have felt very, very, I'll even use the word icky. Yeah. For you. So I'll tell you, because this is, I was actually going to write a newsletter about this and I probably still will because I'm getting into writing more. I was very insecure about being a loan officer for the entire six years that I did it while I was living in California. I would run into people and they'd be like, you went to Cornell and you're alone, you're in the mortgage business. And then I moved back to New York and I started hanging out with finance guys who were like enamored by the story. Like, what was it like working in the mortgage business during like pre-crash and like, all they wanted to know everything. Like they were here writing all the yeah. you know, collateral, all the, all the, they're, they're on this side, uh, securitizing all the bonds that blew up and they're like, whoa, we don't really know anyone that's worked. And like these weren't just um, uh, these weren't just conversations to like learn about you know the the goofy they they were actually very interested and something around like talking to more and more people and sharing frontline stuff and I could speak a little bit more on the technical nature of it too something flipped one day and I'm like okay this is fine this profession is cool and then I started to meet more people who you know have good college degrees and are also in this business but it took a while I used to be really screwed up over it. Yeah, but it's also a matter of like the energy of the room that you're in. So if you are every day going into a room with like sleazeballs totally. who are probably having conversations about like pulling a fast one here and those conversations are going on every single day, that takes a toll on a person, yeah. especially a person who's like an actual empathetic good person. Yep. So right, the industry quickly after the crash moved away and was like, you can't even write those loans if you want to. So it cleaned itself up and then you're right. The people yeah. that stayed were, you know, a different, you know, caliber of people. And so you're like, my business partner, David, he went to Penn, you know, so, and I don't even think about it. I didn't bring him on to, to do this thing because he went to Penn, but yeah, there's, I found my people. There's a lot more validity in that. Mm -hmm. Totally. So 
when you moved back and you got back into, and you were now in the mortgage game in New York, mm -hmm. had you already started your own business? No. So getting your, new, your broker's license in New York is very difficult. So I moved back to New York. I actually kept my licenses active all along after the crash. I had like a 15, 20 person team out in Cali that I had formed and created overnight. It was it's a gone. lot. Yeah, it was a good sized team. Overnight it was gone, right? Really, truly. So um, I shut it down, but I didn't, I didn't turn my licenses off. So I had, I had Cali only, California. Moved to New York. My wife was who I met in New York, but she was also living in LA at the time. We were there living together and she was ready to come back. She's from here. So we moved back at the end of 08, really no business. Um, I was gonna potentially go to business school, start working on Wall Street with those guys. Uh, my best friend who was already working on Wall Street was like, go to business school, get into a good school so I can convince you know the people I work with to hire you because you know that matters or used to and then we'll you know we'll work in finance and this was in 2008 2009 2008 2009 and when did you and Robin meet Robin and I met in uh, 07 August 07 got it and when you were talking about going back to business school um, was she a cheerleader for that or was she more on the side of like well why don't you just keep going with the mortgage industry, which you've done for the last over half a decade? So it's funny, cheerleader, but Robin and I met the day one of the biggest mortgage banks went under. <laughs> she only knew bad times in the well, mortgage business. Right, but just Literally, like, and like just August like, 2nd, I So think. just like with you, when you started at this first company mm -hmm. that were a bunch of assholes, right. that was, that's what you knew. Right. So this is your experience, but then you had a better experience. But now she only knows the worst of the worst. Totally, yeah. But she, <laughs> she was still supportive because uh, she kind of knew whatever I went all in on would, would work. Um, there was a period of time while I was applying to business school and waiting, my brother, who's an actor in New York City, does SAT tutoring, and him and I started an SAT tutoring company. Like I helped him actually like form and build something. We did that, I did that for two years, and then when mortgages picked back up, yeah. I was like, I think I really love mortgages. Like, you know, it's like you're going back to your ex. <laughs> Probably making some more money. Yeah, making yeah. more money. I, uh, I was like, hey, Drew, tutoring company's yours. Um, I'm, going, I'm going back in. Uh, and then it was just, I mean, 10, 10 or so amazing years. At which company? So a bunch, right? So my first mortgage brokerage in LA was called Endicott Place Mortgage. It's a street I grew up on in Tampa. Then I came here. Worked for, I didn't get my license right away. And then eventually like a year or two later, me and a guy named Scott, another guy named Scott, we started Scott Capital Group together. Ah, uh, see, I two didn't Scots. know that. I, I met you and you had Scott, I met you, you were at Scott Capital or had, owned Scott Capital. And I thought, I didn't know that there was another Scott. Yep. So now it makes more sense that yep. you didn't just name it after yourself. Yep. It was Scott Capital because there's more than one. So it wasn't egotistical. It was more of a team thing. Yeah, Scott Capital. Okay, I like that. He originally had a different name. Maybe you'll like it better. It was All County Capital Corp. He kind of started ah, it first. All, all, county, uh, all County could be a contractor. Uh, right. All County could right. be anything. Right. So I convinced him. I'm like, dude, we're both Scots. That's pretty rare. Yeah. Like we DBA'd it, turned it into Scott Capital Group. And um, so yeah, 2020 came around. You want, want me to keep going yeah. on this? Um, so the craziest part of all of this is uh, the friend I'm referencing, Wall Street friend, Adam, he, um, he ended up getting out of Wall Street and became like a, a, a tech startup guy. Started a tech company, built it, scale, sold it. Um, he came to me, always good business conversations. He's like, why don't you scale a mortgage company? Um, I was like, well, I'm really focused on my own production. It's fruitful and uh, I've never really found a minute of time to go and try to find like a good partner. And I've always known I need someone else by my side. I, everyone says it's lonely at the top kind of thing. And I, I could never be just the only head guy thing. Like I well, know myself. They always say, if you want to go somewhere fast, go alone. If you want to go somewhere far, you go together. Dude, I like that. It's great. Never heard that. So he's like, well, I have talent. I was like, who, why? He's like, well, I just sold my company. And um, there's a bunch of great, people there, I'm leaving eventually, and I wanna mentor them and help them find their next place. Love Cause that. the company will survive, but not, it won't be the same. Really cool. So I was like, all right, he's like, I could put 
four people in your in your inbox like tomorrow you got to convince them to join the mortgage business um good luck with that he's like i'll help you so the first guy he came out to williamsburg uh, david my partner now we met this was late 19. business was great pre-covid rates hadn't fall into like all-time lows but like the 10-year treasury was already at like one six which meant mortgage rates were at like probably three five without covid so much good business buyers a healthy I, economy i remember that I, I remember that time right because i remember having conversations with with buyers that the this is a historical low mm -hmm. it, it, right this totally. is a historical low mm -hmm. if you look at the trend it will it is going to likely go up, and I'm not saying go buy so you need to lock this down, but I'm telling you in the next seven months, it'll likely start going up. And then we went towards COVID. Right. And even I remember customers at three and a half, they're like, I think I'm gonna pay a point or two and get like 299, because like, I'm gonna have this loan forever. Yep. I was like, the only problem with that is when they got to like four, we were all like, this is crazy low. And then they went lower, but I was like, you're probably right. right? And then COVID happened. And so that person refinanced anyway. Um, but so business was great. I was small. It was me and maybe four or five other loan officers. I was doing the bulk of the business. They were having some good business. We had, you know, 10 to 15 support people uh, under Scott Capital Group. And um, I met David and he was like, first conversation, this was cool, interesting. It wasn't like, I'm good, you know, nice to meet you. COVID hits and I'm drowning in business, mostly refinances. And so I'm talking to Adam or whatever. And he's like, here's the deal. David's going to business school in the fall. He already told me he got into MIT. Um, Not bad. And so why don't you hire him now? He's going to leave Vettery. Vettery is a company Adam sold soon. And why don't you hire him? and um, bring him on as a consultant for the summer. He has no job. If you guys mix well, maybe he'll get out of business school in two years. Was and go he to like a relative, relatively recent grad? Uh, he had five, six years out of college. Got it. So I think he did a couple years in investment banking and then like four or five years at Vettery. Uh, I was like, cool. I'm like, I could work on operational efficiencies and all. He was an operations guy at, at Vettery. I was like, I could use him overnight. Like if he sinks his teeth into this, I bet in 30 days, he'll help me free up 30%. You know, I could do this, you know, 30% more loans without having to go and hire people. The problem at the time is you couldn't find a processor anywhere in our business. Everyone wanted the talent out there to help everyone close more loans. They were, they were leaving for 50%, 100% raises and stuff. And so not only did I need to keep my team, I needed to hire more, but I couldn't. And so I was like, yeah, David, come in here and help us do more loans without needing to go to the marketplace. So he came on board, things went well right out of the gate. And I think it was maybe like June or July where I started to like, you know, nudge him and be like, maybe you shouldn't go to business school. Like, let's do it. I'll leave Scott Capital Group. We'll build something new and exciting. It's like, no way, man. I, I, no, it wasn't like that. It was probably like, wow, interesting, but I've already got my apartment in Cambridge. I've already accepted it. I gotta go to business school. And by the way, I love this and I wanna keep the conversation going. I'm picturing you like maybe make a spreadsheet, a full deck. Right. Here's what it's gonna cost you to go to Cambridge. Right. And uh, in, in the next like seven years, it'll, you know, you can hammer away on what it's gonna cost you. Or you can forego that, start your career now, right. and here's what your income will be right. next year. Save and then compound, then right. compound. Save the student loan debt. You know what the actual, I think, maybe what sealed the deal is, and this was with, with, with Adam helping me. Um, we're like, dude, business school is going to suck. There's no bar. You're not going out to bars. You're not hanging out with people. It's COVID. You're going to be you're going to be living in Boston. Yeah. Maybe you'll get to go to classrooms sometimes. Then you're back to your apartment. Like you're supposed to collaborate. Business school is all about meeting people and building lifelong relationships, and that's done. Business school, like, don't go to business school. Good and, timing for you. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> slowly but surely, after enough nudging. He said, all right, I'm in. I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I think he was able to defer for a year mm -hmm. so he could always go. He had to like cancel his lease. He had to drive with a U-Haul and take his stuff out of his apartment Good. in Boston and kind of the rest is history. So we got our form formation docs together and everything like August of 2020. And um, we actually started with a different model. We were not gonna go big loan officers. Like someone could 
be listening to this and critique and be like, I would never do the model Scott's doing. I would never hire all of these salespeople who want more and more and more and have egos and everything and give them so much of the pie. It's gonna be a revolving door. Like that's a terrible model, right? Which they're not necessarily wrong, but I think we figured it out. We were doing something different. We were bringing on loan off uh, people who had no experience in the mortgage business, wanted 10 to 15 names, who had all the right raw talent, right? All the aptitude for it, but no experience. We don't want any baggage or whatever. So are there like certain industries that you know to kind of poach out of? Like mm -hmm. you see like, hey, this type of background, go get it. This type of background, go get it. it tech sale, David came from tech sales. So it was more like low hanging fruit mm -hmm. of people he knew that had already had a bit of a proven track record that would like grind for lack of a better word. and you know, we're money driven, but really they had to have incredible bedside manner and customer service, you know, polite, nice, all those things, like not hard sales people, right? Um, nurturers. Yeah, nurturers and really like kind of how I think I work in this business, you know, advising and all that stuff. Um, we are on our way. We got like seven or eight good guys. And now, by the way, I was going to completely hand over my book of business to this team to help help them scale. We wanted to get them each to about 100 million in production, you know, 100 million in closed loan business per year. That would put us at like a billion dollars in closed business. Um, amazing and with different profit margins because we're doing all this work for them. It was a great model. We were on our way, um, um, on our way for sure. Never got to a point where we were very successful with it. And then, you know, the Fed came in and rate skyrocket and the biggest problem we had was that the proof of concept wasn't there enough for these guys and they're like this industry is screwed for a long time yeah and i haven't been in it long enough to believe that i can make it through this so most of them not all of them but most of them left and went into a different industry what's the biggest lesson you learned going from mortgage sat tutoring mm -hmm. back to mortgage and then the downfall of the mortgage game and having to pick it back up like it, so a bunch, the, right? The roller coaster. So, like, what's the biggest lesson you learned on this roller coaster? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. Uh, I'm proud of myself for coming right back into mortgages. It was a little bit of an, a challenging moment with my brother because before mortgages came back, I wanted to grow this as I wanted to be really successful in SAT tutoring, right? So, to leave that and come here um, was difficult, but I could have not, and I'm thrilled that I did now and. Um, obviously I got over that hump of being insecure about being in this business, which was big. And when I look back now, feel silly. Um, I have no hesitation to share what I do and, and, and be in this industry. So that was a growth, a personal growth thing that I love. Um, I mean, my takeaway from there is like, yeah, just, you know, ultimately be true to yourself, whatever that is. And, you know, don't be, don't be ashamed of, of what you're doing. If you're doing the right thing, there's a, of course, the way to do the right thing in the mortgage business, and almost everyone's doing it that way now. Uh, you know, your people respect you, and people, I guess, don't really care as much about what your profession is than kind of who you are as a person. Um, today, I mean, those two years, so we had to scale back. We had to do a lot of layoffs in early 2022. We had like 40 to 50 operational staff, processors, and everything. Oof grew in our bank. <laughs> I was at that office, it was massive. It was awesome, so we had this whole vision. So the reason Go Rascal is so funky is because we said we need a tech style, a tech kind of style company yep. that will allow us to recruit people out of college who want to come to New York and work for like a tech startup and we'll come in and mortgages mm -hmm. instead. And we felt our pitch was, hey, this is a tried and true industry. You can go into the tech business, but most of them won't make it some unicorns out there, come to a cash flowing business, it's fun, whatever. So we need to create that environment. So we're like, we can't be, you know, first funding mortgage or whatever. We need to be, there's no mortgage in our name. So it started that way, it's different now. So where did um, the name Go Rascal come from? So we work with a branding agency, like a full, full, full agency. You know, when you're starting a tech company and your name matters is what you do. Adam, again, he introduced us to this company or a few options and they take you through a whole journey to find your archetype. David and I, I mean, hours on end. Then they present you with, is how it works. They present you with five names. Uh, you don't have to pick any, but they feel they've done the work. And I mean, 
one of them was like the name of a bird. I can't remember. One was um, uh, Veery, V-E-E-R-Y. One was, um, uh, I'll think of another. But anyway, the only one that stood out was it was Rascal. It's just Rascal. Now, like, here's why we like Rascal. We feel like you guys are kind of like counterculture. It's a playful name. It's different. It's out there. Um, we're going to brand it with like a dog for it to be... Um, you know, friendly and loving, but goofy and not mischievous. We're like, wait a minute, rascal, that connotes like bad. Yeah. And this industry just went through like the worst stain ever. <laughs> like, what are you doing here? And they're like, wait till you see the branding. We're like, all right, we think we like rascal, but show us the branding. And then they put the cute dog with a house hat on it, and the R in the tail. Um, yeah. Here and here. Uh, I'm now noticing that the hat is a house. The hat's a house, the R in the tail. Um, so it was rascal only. We're like, rascal mortgage, right? They're like, no, rascal. We're like, Oy. rascal, how can I help you? We're like, ah, we need more syllables. Yeah. So like, no, trust us. We're like, okay. So we went to buy rascal.com, no, half a million bucks. Couldn't even find the guy. So we're like, we can't get rascal. We're like, they're like, get go rascal. Go daddy, action word. We're like, okay. And then we apply to the New York banking department and they're like, your name can't be Go Rascal and your site just say Rascal everywhere. Very strict, consumer, you know, very highly regulated. Then we woke up to the idea that we like Go Rascal better. It flows better. It's 100%. More, totally. The branding agency, we were done with them by then. So we never went back and like had a convo. David and I were like, yes, Go Rascal all day long. And so that's how Go Rascal was found. So it was originally more of like a, a customer facing recruiting mechanism still is a recruiting mechanism. It right? is, and it's it's playful, it's fun, and it's funny that who came up with that it's the the happiest place for loan happiest officers. Happiest home for loan officers. We workshop that on our Q four offsite meeting we had with a coach we work with. Right? He's like, All right, how is your mission statement? We're like, This is what it is. We had just started working with him. He's like, Are you happy with that? We're like, No. It's like, okay. 10 minutes later, we're like, talk, like, what are we creating? It's a loan officer centric business. All right, like, what do you want it to be? We're like, happy. I think it might've been me, might not. It's like, all right, happiest home for loan officers. Yeah, so, I love that. So yeah. like my friends who own uh, Boris and Horton, mm -hmm. which is love the that dog cafe, there they say this is the happiest place on earth. Oh, really? So I'm like, oh, the dog's happiest place on earth. Rascal, go rascal happiest place on earth or happiest place for loan officers on earth happiest home yeah happiest home happiest home happiest home we got a little and then, oh, and then the, the it, there's just layers on yeah. there cuz now the home and yeah what we haven't done a great job of yet is is brand, is putting the brand out there the, the happiest home piece you'll still see uh, the breed a different breed on our website we might not change that cuz that some consumers come there but we'll get going with with uh, with sharing that a bit more i got a it. i got a merch idea for you yeah i'll tell you off off the record. okay but yeah just got a good i'm merch pretty idea. sure if you have a merch idea it's we'll we'll start producing it tomorrow yeah it's, it's good it's good so. it's for your people uh so tell me what are you what are you reading right now i am reading getting things done tell me tell me about it you know the book no so getting it's things done gtd i forgot who wrote it it's a classic it was around um it's been around for 25 years. He just did a re, uh, a rewrite to incorporate I'm gonna, technology. I'm saying I don't know it. I'm going to now look it up and I'm going to see the cover and be like, oh, of course. I, yeah. I, it's like White in my library. Um, it is, uh, yeah, listen, it's more, it's probably more of a personal. No, it's everything. I mean, I, I need, I want to get more organized. It's just all about capturing to do's and thoughts, getting them down outside of your brain and then identifying whether they're actually a to-do or it's more of just a thought that could be revisited. And there's a bunch of different ways, formats. You could just use a notepad. Uh, our coach uses notes and has all his different things set up. And so any single to-do goes, it gets its own note. So it's not like today's to-dos, you get its own note because the minute you do it, you delete it and it's out. Right? What do you do for your to-do list? So I'm, I'm adapting that. So I'm about, I don't know, a third of the way through the book. Mm -hmm. And so I live off the of notes. I'll sometimes jot things down. Like I was just at Physically. a mortgage conference. I find, so I didn't realize this. I've been in the, doing, in the business world for 12 years. I'm very much a visual learner. I, I, I couldn't conceptualize that to you if you asked me six months ago, I'd say, Maybe it kind of sounds right. And I just woke up one day in our meetings and everything. Like 
I need to see things in writing. I always tell David, like, can you throw that up on the monitor and put it on a screen? I, it never naturally came to me. And so if I'm in meetings or whatever and I wanna bring my phone out, I'll have to have a notepad so I can jot things down. And then I'll go discipline-wise, try to go back to my desk, convert that into to-dos or notes, or just look with AI and ChatGPT, I'll throw it into ChatGPT, say summarize this, copy and paste it and put it into notes. Um, I love that. Yeah. Glad. Now there's stuff where, I mean, I'm just, I'm just getting, yeah, this is brand new for me, tip of the iceberg, but you can put it into ChatGPT and then feed it into something else that will like summarize it way better and AI is nuts. Yeah, and it's only Are you better. using it at all? I use ChatGPT almost every day. Yeah. 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 Um, at, at least four or five days a week. Yeah. We're also, from a business standpoint, we just became huge traction people, which is the EOS platform, um, which is just all about building like quarterly goals. They call them rocks. Meeting with your team leaders every Monday to go through the goals and if they're on track or off track. So we're, we're slowly becoming like, you know, fully dialed into that, that methodology. This is um, amazing. And people are really, obviously your loan officers are extremely receptive of the business model and any changes that have been made. They're receptive, they're um, retaining, you're, you're retaining them at a high rate. We have a hundred percent retention. Um, hundred percent. Uh, so, I should say a hundred percent of who we want to retain. We okay. retain. I like that. Uh, we will not have a hundred percent retention forever. Um, New York is an interest. Most loan officers leave a shop like ours to go open their own brokerage. New York makes helps us with that. It's very difficult to do. If you lived in California, mm -hmm. you could get your own brokerage off the ground in sixty days. New York, it could be two years Jesus. and possibly never. So loan officers in New York, which is where we recruit most of them, they kind of know this, or if they don't know, they go explore it and then they come back and say, okay, I'm not leaving. And with our model, our goal is to try to set this up. So someone says, I thought about it, but for what I'm getting and the support I'm getting with the balanced blueprint, uh, there's no way I'm leaving. Uh, and there's other additional tools and benefits to working here with 100, 200 loan officers soon that I would never get from having my own solo shop. Plus the responsibility, plus the legal. Oh, compliance, legal, yeah. payroll, annual reports. I mean, in our business, we're, we're right up there with the most regulated business in yep. the country, right? I mean, mortgages got crack, crashed and burned, uh, and so the regulation's out of control. Um, so, uh, Give me one book recommendation, your number one go-to book that you would recommend to anybody? I wish you would have prepped me for that before. God, um, I don't think I'm your guy for that. Uh, I'm not a huge reader, frankly. It takes a lot for me to read a book. So what style of reading do you usually go for? Because right now you're reading a book. Uh, Podcast. Right now you're reading a self-help book. Right? Yep, yep. Book. I only read self-help. So what's your number one self-help business book <sighs> that has had an effect on you? My wife has about a million of them, and so I'll often like start and not finish. Um, I don't got that for you. What should it be? What's yours? Uh, mine is Never Split the Difference. Chris Voss, mm -hmm. like by far the best. Like it is a cheat code for life. Um, That's my next. Yeah. What do you know about this new one, the old guy from 11 Park Madison about... 11 Madison Park? 11 Madison Park about... Uh, Will, 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 it's Will, a brand new Will, one and it's all over the socials. Wait, are you talking about... Um, Came out a couple months ago. It's like a oh yellow cover called like... Oh, uh, Unreasonable Hospitality. Yes. Read that last year. Oh, oh. It's been out for longer. Okay. Read that. Is it I, possibly just catching its like moment? Or potentially, I, it or did out, I just get like uh, maybe highly recommend it? Before reading that, I read Setting the Table, mm -hmm. which is Danny Meyer's mm -hmm. book. Will Godara bought Eleven Madison from Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer's book is all about hospitality, of course. Will Godara is all about hospitality, how he got into the restaurant game, how he then started working at Eleven Madison, bought it from Danny, how they went from being like recognized as top restaurant in the world, but more so they like made it into like the top 30, mm. top 10, and eventually number one, and just some really cool stories about hospitality. And me, I love it. I love empathy, I love hospitality, and unreasonable hospitality, highly, highly, highly recommend. Yeah. Good and for salespeople, yeah. Yeah, you know what book you could recommend to people? Thin From Within. 
<laughs> I should. You're right, man. That right. would have been a good point. All right, so let's do this again. All right. <laughs> Give me Take one two. book recommendation that you recommend to anybody to read. I've read a, thousands of books in my life. I'm an avid reader. Right? Like, I read a book a day almost. Impressive. Um, and uh, there's just really one that, that stands at the top. And it's not going to sound like a business book, but it is uh, if you make it one. And it's this incredible nutrition and gut health book called Thin From Within. Amazing. And it's all about gut nurturing health, your gut. Great recipes. And your stomach. And if you take care of your gut, everything else will fall into place. Your intuition, your decision making. Um, it was written by this brilliant author. Uh, her name is Robin Euclid. Robin Euclid. Yeah. Uh, she's very inspirational. I've, I, I know her. Yeah. You should have her on your podcast. I've, I've been trying. She's, <laughs> a very, she's very hard to get a hold of. That's my wife. Oh! Yeah. I love that. Thank you for that plug. Yeah, you got yeah, it. That was good. We'll cut that up to be perfect. Yeah. That'll be a great reel. Right. Um, so before I do let you go, mm -hmm. give me one word of advice for anyone trying to make it. Um, I, think, I think it's got to come back to like authenticity. I do. I was on with my coach yesterday. Uh, and his name's John Matzner, he's awesome. We found him on Twitter. And I'm like, I gotta get my social media going, right? He's like, I gotta shoot these videos, these reels or whatever. Um, Cause I think where we're lacking is getting our name out there in mass to get a ton of loan officers showing interest, showing up to the webinar or whatever. Uh, and he's, I think the biggest thing I took away and the way he worded it was different, but he's like, essentially only do what you're gonna do, right? Now I like writing, I'm a visual person. I don't love shooting videos like that, right? It's just right. He's like, create a newsletter now. He's like, don't do Twitter because loan officers don't hang out on Twitter. He's like, create your newsletter and then you know, you'll tease it on LinkedIn. Like you only have to, within this space, you only have to do the format that you like. You don't have to shoot video. And I said, you know what? But one of my rocks, one of my goals for Q1 is to shoot 12 videos, a video a week. He said, have you ever tried long form video? I was like, what do you mean by that? He's like, just having a conversation with someone for 15 minutes. I'm like, you mean a podcast? He's like, in theory, it could be a podcast. You could also go talk to someone for 30 minutes and put that up on LinkedIn. And so that immediately resonated with me because like, yeah, I'll, I'll have a video camera on me and my VP of growth or whatever, and we'll strategically talk about things that are valuable. Way, it speaks way more to me than having to cut like a 90, minute, 90 second video. And so like, he's forcing me to say, find the forum you want and only do that. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. And Amen. To me, that's authenticity, right? Like, like just honor who you are and don't don't fight it. Don't fight it, and it'll come out one way or another. Oh, that was great. Thanks, Scott Fallon's Go Rascal. <laughs> Best mortgage business in the game. <laughs>